morning. God bless you. Those that are watching on Facebook Live and YouTube, I pray that God's blessings will be upon you and your family. And thank you so much for choosing to watch today. And you that are here, I just if this is your first time at First Assembly, we say welcome. And you will find in your bulletin today a communication card. And if you just take the time to fill out that communication card and uh, place it at the Welcome Center. And Linda's helping us there. And we have a special gift for you. And uh, if you also, after you fill out that, uh, fill that out, if, if you have a prayer need, anyone has a prayer need or a praise report that they would like to share with us on Wednesday nights, we've been having a great time of prayer on Wednesday night. I encourage you to come. We have a time of worship, and I share from the Word, and then we have a time of praying one for another. And so if you have a need you would like for us to pray with you about, put that on the back of this communication card. And also, if you have a praise report, we always enjoy hearing the good things of what God has done for you. And so put that as well on the back of your communication card. And so God bless you. Thank you so much for choosing to worship with us today. I pray God ministers to you by the Holy Spirit. Well, our remodeling is going forward. And hopefully, uh, we're going to be having carpet down within the next four to six weeks. A brand new carpet, and they have customized it for us. You're going to love it. And uh, they are going to be coming Again, once again, uh, Wednesday, just to look things over and, and measure things and make sure everything is just right. And I am looking forward to it. So uh, thank you so much for your giving because it's, it covers, it is able, we're able to cover all of it because of your giving. Also, we started two new classes, two new Sunday school classes this morning. And one was building healthy marriages and the other one is our young adults class and encourage you to come. I think we have, there were eight in our young adults class, I mean uh, in our building healthy marriages class, not counting myself, and then there was some that were in the young adults class and so I encourage you to come. If you're in that age group, 18 to 30, they're meeting in the first classroom on this hallway and building healthy marriages. It doesn't matter if you've been married for just a short length of time or you've been married for a long length of time. We can, always, we can always have room for improvement in our marriages. And so that is the last classroom on this side. And it's about six weeks long. And I am teaching this class. Also, today's Mission Sunday. And so thank you so much for your giving to missions. And we give around $1,300 every month to missions. And it's because of your faithful giving to the Lord. And I pray God will bless you and meet the needs that you have in your family, in your life. And at the close of the service, we're going to be having a, the kiddos going to be doing a dash for cash. And so get your coins ready, get your dollar bills ready, get your checks ready. Leave them blank so we can fill it in for you. <laughs> Amen. Also, also on October the 26th, mark it down on your calendars, October the 26th, that Wednesday evening, we're going to be having a time for the kiddos, safe place, they can get some candy and Play a few games. And so our fall festival will happen on that Wednesday night, 6.30 to 8 o'clock. And if you could help us by bringing candy, individually wrapped pieces of candy, that would be helpful. And also by signing the sign-up sheet that is in the foyer to be a volunteer. And you say, oh, Pastor, I, I can't stand for very long. That's fine. We have games where you can just sit. And all you have to do is hand out candy to the kiddos. And so if you can help us on the Wednesday night, the 26th, that would be much appreciated. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for your giving. Thank you so much for your faithfulness unto God. How many know that God is good and His goodness and His mercy endures forever? God has been faithful to meet every need. There's not one need that we can ever look back on and say, God did not meet the need. Now, He may not have met a want, but He always meets our needs. According, as His Word says, according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus and He's not short on riches. He owns everything. And I have found out that God is faithful to his promises and his word. That as I honor him and put him first in the area of my giving, of my tithe and offering, God has always met the need. He has supplied food for our table, clothes, and roof over our head. God is faithful. Amen. And so thank you so much for your giving to the Lord. And may God richly, richly bless you for that. And thank you for your missions giving. And if you are giving, on, you can give online today. 
And if you are giving online today, make sure you specify what is going to tithe and offering and what is going to our missionaries. And I want to say thank you so much for your giving last Sunday morning to our missionaries, Jason and Sarah Morris. Thank you so much for your giving to them. And we were able to give them an offering of $3,400. That is awesome, my friend. That is awesome. And that's the goodness and the greatness of God. And that's your faithfulness to the Lord. You're giving to God. And, and he told you, he told you last Sunday that someone has offered to match every dollar that comes in up to $25,000. And I want you to pray that they'll be able to reach that $25,000 because there's a great need for the country that they are going to in Asia area. And so I'm believing that God is going to meet that need for them. And so thank you so much for your giving to God. Let's pray. Over this offering, let's ask God to speak to us by the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you today for your many blessings upon us. And we know, God, that if it wasn't for you, we would not be where we are today. And neither would we have what we have. God, it is all because of you and your faithfulness to us. We thank you most of all, God, that you are the greatest giver. In that you gave the greatest gift of all. You gave your son Jesus Christ to go to the cross and to pay our sin debt in full. And Lord, your heart is that of a giver. And Lord, we are to have your heart. And I pray, God, that as we give and honor you with the first fruits, that is the first portion of our income, I pray, God, that you would meet the needs of your people. Lord, and you would supply whatever need may be in their lives. I pray for their families. I pray blessings upon them, that you would keep them and that you would make your face shine upon them and give them peace. I pray, O oh God, that you would bless our missionaries. And Lord, I thank you for such a generous church. And Lord, that, that believes in missions and believes in reaching souls for the kingdom of God because that is your heart. You're not willing that any perish but all come to repentance. And I pray, God, that you would bless the missionaries and bless your people as they give to missions. And we give you praise and glory, and it all goes to you in Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen. Great to see you this morning. If you have your Bibles today, Genesis chapter 43. Genesis chapter 43. How many of you enjoy going to family reunions? How many look forward to going to family reunions? Get your hand up. I see a few of you. Yes. Yes, I see those back there. Now, how many of you endure going to family reunions? Let me see your hand. Tell the truth, shame the devil. Yes, there are several of you right there. I see those hands. Well, true story, true story. I read about one family who is taking a lot of pictures at their family reunion. That's, that's normally what happens. You do just take a lot of pictures at family reunions. And after the pictures were taken, a lady took them to the photo shop and asked if they could be touched up, if they could touch up the wrinkles and such things. The man said, yes, ma'am, we can do that. She said, and could you take 30 pounds off of me? The man said, yes, ma'am, we can actually do that. And then she said, great, could you put the 30 pounds on my sister-in-law then? <laughs> that is not what we call family unity. You know, can you imagine, can you imagine what it would be like to see a sibling that you thought was gone forever, only to be reunited with that sibling after 22 years. That's a long time. And that's what happened with Joseph and his brothers. They thought that he was gone forever. They had sold him for 20 pieces of silver and thought, we will never see his face again. They intended it for evil. They intended to harm him. But God took 
what they intended for evil and turned it around and used it for the good in the life of Joseph. You see, they intended it for evil. They were being used by Satan. But this just shows us that when Satan thinks that I can overrule the plan of God, that God can take it and he can twist it and take what the enemy may mean for evil and use it for the good in our lives. He did it for Joseph, my friend. And he can do it for you today. He can do. He can use it for our good and His glory. That just shows us that God is in control. That God can to take the plans of Satan and use them for His good and His glory. For our good and His glory. You see, Joseph was hated by his brothers, sold into slavery for twenty pieces of silver, taken by the Ishmaelites down to Egypt. Sold as a slave to Potiphar. He worked with and Potiphar, and Potiphar put Joseph over everything that he had in his household. Mrs. Potiphar lied about Joseph. And Potiphar put Joseph in the prison where the king's prisoners were kept. And it seemed as if Joseph was all forgotten about. Forgotten for several years. But God, God, providentially promoted Joseph from the jailhouse to the penthouse in just a matter of seconds. My friend, only God can do something like that. I said only God can do something like that. He promoted Joseph to second in command under Pharaoh. It was a God thing. A man who had no training whatsoever is now governor over all of Egypt. Only God can do that. And because of the famine that was so severe in the land, even stretching into Canaan where Joseph's family lived, his father, his father Jacob, sends his sons to Egypt to buy food. And what do they do when they arrive in Egypt? They bow down to Joseph who is in charge of all of the food in the land. They bow down just like the dream God had given him. Remember this, my friend. God will always fulfill his promises. What God has promised, he will fulfill. And God fulfilled the dreams that he had given to Joseph. Let me remind you, God can fulfill the dreams that he has given to you. And he can promote you to the destiny that He has in store for your life. And He wants to use you for His purpose and for His glory and to promote His kingdom. We've been looking at our series, From Dreams to Destiny. From Dreams to Destiny. And I want to talk to you this morning about displacing fear with grace. Displacing fear with grace. Look at verse number 15. In Genesis 43. When we come to Genesis 43. His brothers are headed back to Egypt again to buy food. And Joseph is still in charge as governor. Joseph's brothers still don't know that he is on the throne as the prime minister. And when they came the first time to buy food, Joseph kept Simeon in prison. And said, don't return. If you decide to return, make sure that you return with your youngest brother, Benjamin. Benjamin was the full brother to Joseph. The other brothers were half-brothers. Jacob, Joseph's dad, didn't want to send Benjamin to Egypt. And in his mind, in his mind, he believes that Joseph is no more, and Simeon is locked up and may never see him again, and if Benjamin goes... He believes that it is all over, that all hope is gone. He feels as if everything in the world is against him. But what he does not realize is this, that God was for him and that God was orchestrating all of the events, everything out for the good in Jacob's life and for his children and for God's glory, the saving of a nation. And so finally... Finally, Jacob gets enough courage and decides to send his sons, and with Benjamin included, back to Egypt, loaded down with gifts and silver. And verse 15 says, 
So the men took the gifts and doubled the amount of silver. And Benjamin also. They hurried down to Egypt and presented themselves to Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, Take these men to my house, slaughter an animal, and prepare dinner. They are to eat with me at noon. The man did as Joseph told him and took the men to Joseph's house. Now the men were frightened when they were taken to his house. They thought, look what they say. We were brought here because of the silver that was put into our sacks the first time. He wants to attack us, overpower us, and seize us as slaves and take our donkeys. So they went up to Joseph's steward and spoke to him at the entrance to the house. Please, sir, they said, we came down here the first time to buy food. But at the place where we stopped for the night, we opened our sacks and each of us found his silver, the exact weight, in the mouth of the sack. So we have brought it back with us. We've also brought additional silver with us to buy food. We don't know who put our silver in our sacks. It's all right, he said. Don't be afraid. Your God, the God of your father, has given you treasure in your sacks. I have received your silver. Then he brought Simeon out to them. Displacing fear with grace. Number one, write it down. The paralyzing power of fear. The paralyzing power of fear. When Joseph's brothers arrive in Egypt, and Joseph sees them. He tells his steward to take them to his house and slaughter an animal and prepare a big feast because they are going to eat at noon. So picture this with me. These guys have traveled all the way from Canaan to Egypt. It's around 65 miles. And when they arrive in Egypt, the steward says to Joseph's brothers, come with me, and he takes them to Joseph's private house. And when this happens, Joseph's brothers become fearful. They're terrified. They think, we have been led into a trap. He is out to get us because of the silver that was in our sacks the first time we came to buy food. They say, he's going to make us slaves. They're thinking, oh no, oh no. We've had it. It is over. Oh no, what are we going to do now? You know, and that is exactly what fear will do to you. That's what fear will do to you. It will grip your life. It will keep you from walking by faith. And it will keep you from the destiny that God has in store for your life. It will paralyze you and keep you from walking forward by faith. Just ask the children of Israel what fear will do to you. Fear kept them from inheriting their promised land and caused them to wander around in the desert for 40 years. It will keep you from God's best. Fear keeps us from trusting the Lord and looking to Him for the help we need. And that is exactly what Satan wants. He doesn't want you to trust God. He doesn't want you walking by faith. He wants you to walk by fear because he knows that as you walk by fear, he can bind you and keep you from the destiny that God has in store for your life. And these guys think, oh my goodness, we have been had. They're, they are scared. They're not just scared, they're scared. They're scared. They are beside themselves terrified. They tell Joseph Stewart, look, look. When we came the first time to buy food and left and stopped for the night and found silver in our sacks, we couldn't believe it. We don't know how this happened. Honestly, we don't know how it happened. So here's what we've decided to do. We've decided to bring the silver back with us and we've also brought more silver. Now I want you to catch this. I want you to catch this. Here are these 11 men. Simeon with them. Now, 
And they have been taught about God Almighty, El Shaddai, the God who is all-sufficient and all-powerful, the God who is more than enough. And they have, they have been brought up to know the true and living God. And they are overcome by fear. And they say, wait a minute, wait a minute. They, he is out to get us. And they cannot, because of fear, they cannot see the hand of God at work in their lives. And that's what fear will do. It blinds us to the goodness and greatness of God. And look. Who has to remind them of God's grace, His sovereignty, and His purposes? Look who reminds him. An Egyptian steward. Verse 23. The Egyptian steward says, It's all right. Don't be afraid. Your God, the God of your father, has given you treasure in your sacks. I received your treasure. Then he brought Simeon out. This Egyptian steward is the one who has to remind them of the goodness and the grace of Almighty God. The fact is this, we've all been there before. Trials and problems start coming at us from all directions and we become fearful. Instead of trusting God and putting our faith in God that it's all going to work out for the good in our lives and for God's glory, we become gripped by fear and worry and think, oh no, oh no, what am I going to do now? How am I going to make it? How am I going to get through this situation? How am I going to get through this storm? God, I don't know how it's going to happen. But I want to tell you this morning, I want to tell you this morning, God is faithful to His promises. I said, God is faithful to His promises. You say, Pastor, how do I make it during the trials and storms and the difficulties of life? I'll tell you how to make it. You stand on the promises of God's Word because, my friend, His promises do not fail. His promises do not fail. There are over 365 promises in the Word of God in regards to fear. My friend, that is one for every day for you to stand on and to claim. Let me remind you of just a few of the precious promises of God's word regarding fear. Psalm 27 and verse number 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Verse number 5 says, For in the day of trouble, He will keep me safe in His dwelling. His word says in Psalm 34 and verse number 7, The angel of the Lord encamps round about those who fear Him him and delivers them his word says in Isaiah 43 in verse number 1 fear not for I have redeemed you I have summoned you by name and you are mine when you pass through the waters I will be with you and when you pass through the rivers they will not sweep over you when you walk through the fire you will not be burned the flames will not set you ablaze for I am I am the Lord your God his word says in Isaiah 41 and verse number 10 do not fear for I am with you do not be afraid for I am your God I will strengthen you I will help you I will uphold you with my victorious right hand his word says in in Isaiah 59 verse number 19 that when the enemy comes in like a flood that the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him his word says in Isaiah 54 and verse number 17 no weapon formed against us shall prosper and every tongue that rises up in judgment against us shall be condemned that this is the inheritance of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is from me says the Lord his word says in Deuteronomy 31 and verse number 6 be strong and courageous do not be afraid or terrified because of them for the Lord your God goes with you he will never leave you and never forsake you his word says in 2nd Chronicles 32 and verses 7 and 8 be strong and courageous do not be afraid or discouraged because of the king for there is a greater power with us than with them with him is only the arm of the flesh but with us is the Lord our God who will fight our battles for us his word 
word says in Psalm 56 verses 3 and 4, When I am afraid, I will put my trust in Him. I will trust God. I am not afraid of what people can do to me. I praise God for His promises to me. His word says in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 7, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. His word says in Romans chapter 8 verse 31, If God be for us, who can be against us? His word says in verse 37, We are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. His word says in 1 John 4, 4, Greater is he that is within me than he that is in the world. Let me encourage you, my friend. Stand on the promises of God's word because they will not fail. Hallelujah. Stand on the truths of God's word. His promises are a sure foundation. Hallelujah. My friend, he's bigger than your mountain. I said he's bigger than your mountain. He's bigger than your trial. He's bigger than your situation you're facing this morning. He is El Shaddai, the God who's all-sufficient and all-powerful and more than enough for you. He's the God who created the universe and he created it with, with and everything in it by the sound of his voice, by speaking it into existence. Everything in the world, he spoke it into existence. And what did you say your problem was? My friend, it's not too big for the God we serve. What are you fearful of? Because he has promised to hear you and to answer you and to show you great and mighty things. He's promised to uphold you and to provide for you and to sustain you. There's no situation too big for the God that we serve. You know, the devil wants you to walk in fear. He wants you to take your eyes off God and look at the situations and the trials because he knows that the more you look at the situation or the more you look at yourself, the less you look at God for the answer and the, le and the more fear will paralyze you. But what we need to do is take our eyes off of ourselves, take our eyes off of the situation and begin to do as the psalmist David said, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. You see, as we magnify the Lord, we get a bigger picture of who God is. It's not that God is bigger than, it becomes bigger. No, he's already bigger than we can think or imagine. It's that we get ourselves, we get a bigger perspective of how big and mighty and great God is. And then as we begin to magnify him, fear leaves and faith arises in our hearts. You see, fear imprisons. But faith liberates. Fear paralyzes, but faith empowers. Fear disheartens, but faith encourages. Fear weakens, but faith empowers. Fear causes hopelessness, while faith rejoices in the power and presence of God. Someone has said, I would rather walk with God in the dark than go alone in the light. That's good. That's good. You see, the more we depend on God, the more dependable we find He is. You don't have to fear because God is forever faithful, my friend. Notice what Joseph's brothers feared. The end of verse number 18. They said, He wants to attack us and empower us and seize us as slaves. Fear has them. But not only fear, guilt. And notice this one thing. The thing that they feared the most was the thing that the very thing that they did to their brother Joseph. They sold him as a slave, and now they're fearing, oh no, he's going to make us slaves. They had lied about their brother, and now they're convinced he's out to get them. And in a sense, or, or they're, and they're convinced also that God is out to get them. And in a sense, they're right. They're right. Because God is using these events to bring them face to face with their past sins. He is awakening them in a sense of guilt. And this guilt is about to eat them alive. You know, guilt can cause us to say strange things at times and do strange things at times. I remember reading a letter that had actually been mailed to the IRS. And it said, Dear Sirs, 
I haven't been able to sleep because last year when I filled out my income tax report, I deliberately misrepresented my income. So I am enclosing a check for $150. Then came the closing line. If I still can't sleep, I'll send you the rest. <laughs> Understand, guilt is not always a bad emotion. Guilt's not always a bad emotion. It can be a healthy emotion. God can use guilt to awaken us to our sinfulness and show us that we need to turn to Christ for forgiveness. Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse number 8, when He, talking about the Holy Spirit, when He comes, He will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. So the Holy Spirit has come to convict the world of guilt, the guilt of sin. And He wants them, wants lost sinners to see their sinfulness, to feel guilty of their sin, and repent and return to Christ. Because sin separates us from close fellowship with the Father. But when we confess our sins, we are brought into fellowship with the Father. I want you to catch something here. I want you to catch something. This steward of Joseph's is the one who has to remind these Hebrew men of the power of God. He tells them, verse 23, it's all good, it's all good. Be at peace, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. Your God, the God, your God, the God of your father, has given you treasure in your sacks. In other words, in other words, I know all about it. I received your silver the first time, but God helped you. We put it back in your sack. It was a treasure from Elohim, the God of your father. You know, notice this. Joseph must have been rubbing off on those that were in the palace. You see, wherever Joseph was, whether it was in Potiphar's house, or whether it was in the prison, or now in the palace, Joseph was constantly talking about God and the goodness of his God. My friend, I would encourage you today, wherever you are, Whatever situation you may find you're in, whether it's a difficult situation or a, or a good situation, whatever the situation, I would encourage you, keep talking about God. Keep talking about the Lord because you are Christ's representative to a lost world. You are Christ's ambassador. And we need to be speaking up and speaking out for the glory and the kingdom of Almighty God. We need to be letting others know about the goodness of our God and the power of Jesus Christ. We should not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for as Paul says, the power of God and the salvation to everyone who believes. Number two, the liberating power of grace. The paralyzing power of fear, the liberating power of grace. Joseph stewards, Joseph steward reassures them, everything is going to be all right. It's all good. God has given this to you. And then he brings their brother Simeon out. Then he takes them to Joseph's house, helps them freshen up as they prepare their gifts to give to their brother. They don't know it's their brother yet before them that they haven't, that they haven't seen in a long time and they thought they would never see again. Look what verse 26 says. When Joseph came home, they presented to him the gifts they had brought into the house, and they bowed down before him to the ground. He asked them how they were, and then he said, How is your aged father you told me about? Is he still living? They replied, Your servant, our father, is still alive and well. And they bowed low to pay him honor. Joseph arrives on the scene. What do they do? They present him with gifts that they brought and look what else they do they bow down before him once again notice not once but twice they do this the dream is true God keeps his promises Joseph could have gotten even with them he could have said I am now Joseph and revealed himself I'm Joseph and now I am going to have your high but he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. Instead of being angry and harsh, he offers kindness and grace. He's overjoyed to see all of them again. And he asks about their father. He asks, is your father still alive? 
Is he well? And they say, yes, our father is still alive and well. Uh, He's over 100 years of age now. He's still alive and kicking. He's in good health. Well, I added the kicking in there. That's what Texans would say. Verse 29 is an emotional scene. Verse 29. As he looked about and saw his brother Benjamin, his own mother's son, he asked, Is this your youngest brother, the one you told me about? And he said, God be gracious to you, my son. Deeply moved at the side of his brother, Joseph hurried out and looked for a place to weep. He went into pr- in his private room and wept there. I want you to picture this with me. Joseph hasn't seen his blood brother Benjamin in over 20-something years. And now he is seeing him again for the first time. And when they tell him it's Benjamin, Joseph in tenderness says, God, be gracious to you, my son. And then a wave of emotions hit Joseph like a ton of bricks. And he can't control himself. He's overcome and goes to a private room to weep. Look at this. Here is this handsome, buff man, prime minister of Egypt, leader of millions of people, and he is overcome with emotions and has to go to a private room to weep. All the years, all the years of separation, all the seasons being separated, all the birthdays he missed, all the special occasions, all the lowly moments are now coming back to Joseph's memory. It's like a rushing river poured, pouring into a lake, swelling above the dam. He cannot control his emotions. You know, there are times in our lives when situations hit us and we are overwhelmed by our emotions. Sometimes good emotions, sometimes sad emotions. But we are overcome and we break down. You know, if this has ever happened to you, you're in good company. You're in good company. Let me give you some examples. David, David, the psalmist David, King David, broke down and cried when his son Absalom was killed. He said, I wish I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Job, when he lost everything, including his children and his health, cried out to God and said in Job chapter 3, May the day of my birth perish. And the night it was said, a boy is born. Verse 11, Why did I not perish at birth and die as I came from the womb? Elijah, Elijah, right after he called fire down from heaven, and God sent fire from heaven, consumed the sacrifice, and he won the showdown on top of Mount Carmel, became afraid and discouraged in 1 Kings chapter 19. And one of the Baal sisters, Jezzy was her name, threatened to kill him. And he fled to the desert. And he sat down, the Bible says, he sat down under a little tree and prayed that he might die. And he told God, he said, God, I have had enough. I know you've never said that before. God, I've had enough. But then he added to it, Lord, take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Even Moses, the great leader Moses was, after putting up with a grumbling and griping and complaining of the Israelites in the desert, said, God, I've had enough. Numbers 11. He said, I can't carry all these people by myself. The load is far too heavy. If this is how you intend to treat me, just go ahead. Go ahead and put me to death right now. Do me a favor and spare me of my misery. But notice, with each one of these, God didn't send a lightning bolt from heaven and strike these guys dead. What did God do? God came alongside of them and in one way or another encouraged them and reminded them, I love you, I'm with you, And I have a plan and a purpose in store for your life still. You know, I don't know what you may have been taught, but there is no shame, no shame whatsoever 
in being overwhelmed by circumstances. When a loved one is taken by death, when disease rears its ugly head, when your family is ripped apart, when your heart is broken and a thousand other times, it is easy to become overwhelmed and overcome by emotions. And here's the good thing. Jesus understands our emotions. He understands how we feel. He understands our times of weeping and brokenness. He's able to sympathize, the Bible says. He's able to sympathize with us because he's been where we've been. You see, before Jesus went to the cross in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, and as he was praying, the pressure and the weight was so heavy upon him that the Bible says that, he, that his brow began to sweat drops of blood. My friend, he knows what emotion is like. He knows what pressure is like. He understands. And here is the best part. God will never tell on us. God will never tell on us. How wonderful is that? He'll never tell on us. God will never stand up in church and say, Now listen, congregation, let me tell you what Brent told me the other day. God will never say to us, Say, Tell us, hey, wait a minute, let me tell you what Nathan or John or Mary, what they told me last Thursday. God will never stand up and say that. No, he understands. Others may not be able to understand. They may say things like, snap out of it, man, snap out of it. Get it together. But God comes and comforts us and encourages us and sends the Holy Spirit to minister unto us. Let me remind you, Jesus, he was fully God, but he was also fully man. And he knows what you're feeling today. He's fully man so that he can feel what you're feeling this very second right now. But he's also fully God so that he can fix what we feel right now. He is your help. He's the very present help in the time of need. And he will stand with you. He will help you. He will send the Holy Spirit to supply exactly what you need in your time of need. My friend, that's the God that we serve. He is forever faithful. He will never leave us and ever forsake us. And He can handle whatever cares we place in His hands. So I want to encourage you this morning, cast your anxiety, cast your cares upon Him because He cares for you. He cares about the situations that we face in this life. And I am so thankful that He understands and He cares, aren't you? I'm so thankful for that this morning. Number three, God offers abundant grace. Number three, God offers abundant grace. Joseph is in a private room crying, emotionally overcome. He washes his face, gathers himself, and tells his servants to serve the food. Joseph didn't eat with his brothers because Hebrews did not eat with Egyptians. That's what the Bible says, because it was detestable to the Egyptians. And then there's a little humor here, a little humor. Look at verse 33. Joseph decides to have a little fun. The men had been seated before him in the order of their ages, from the firstborn to the youngest. And they looked at each other in astonishment. So catch this. These guys, the Joseph's servant, positions each one of these guys, these brothers, according to their ages, with the oldest first all the way to the younger one. And these guys are no doubt thinking, how in the world does this guy know all about, know this? Know who's the oldest and who's the youngest? This was a coincidence. Someone did the math for us and said there is no less than 39,917,000 different ways in which 11 individuals could have been seated. That's a, lot of thir that's a lot of ways to be seated. They should have said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This guy here, he knows a lot more about our family than we realize. But they didn't have an answer. They were in astonishment. They were in shock. Look what happens next. Verse 34. When portions were served to them from Joseph's table, Benjamin's portion was five times as much as anyone else's. 
So they feasted and drank freely with him. Joseph's brothers are already in shock. They couldn't believe how good they were being treated. They expected the worst. They thought, he's out to get us. He's going to make us slaves. We are going to die. But notice they're receiving the best. They're dining at the table with the prime minister. They're dining with the prime minister. Not at the same table, but they're dining with them. And what a feast. What a feast it was. They were served green Garden salads, thick, juicy T-bone steaks, fried okra, pot- mashed potatoes and gravy, baked sweet potatoes with cinnamon on top, homemade rolls, cornbread, black-eyed peas, homemade chocolate pie, and big glasses of sweet iced tea. Well, that's if Egypt's anything like Texas, that is. And this was all, this was all from Joseph, the prime minister's table. But that's not all. When the portions were served, Benjamin receives five times as much as the other brothers. So when the portions were served, Benjamin received five T-bone steaks, five giant sweet potatoes, five servings of fried okra, five servings of black-eyed peas, five cornbread and five rolls, five pieces of homemade chocolate pie, and five tall glasses of ice sweet tea. And this kid probably thought, I am in hog heaven today. He probably said, you know what? You know what? I might be a little thin, but I'm not that thin. This guy is trying to fight me up. What in the world is going on here? This is crazy. My goodness. But Joseph was overjoyed, and he kept on giving, and he kept on giving, And he kept on giving. And the Bible says they ate and were cheerful and in good spirits. In other words, in other words, their fears all dissipated by this generous entertainment and grace they received. What a picture. What a powerful picture of God's amazing grace. These men were guilty. They were guilty as all get out. And no one would have blamed Joseph if he would have had their hides and thrown them into prison and enslaved them. But Joseph forgives them and welcomes them into his own home. He invites them to eat with him at his table and he shares with them the very best that he has to offer him. You know, I've said it many times during this series on the life of Joseph that Joseph's life is a picture, is a foreshadowing of the life of Jesus Christ. The fact is this. The fact is this. We were all like Joseph's brothers. We were all guilty of sin. We deserve far more than the prison of slavery. We deserve death and we deserve hell. But Jesus, Jesus loved us in spite of our condition. And he went to the cross and he paid it all in full for us. Hallelujah. Sin had left the crimson stain but he washed it white as snow and he brought us in into his very own family. And my friend, he has blessings upon blessings upon blessings upon blessings that he has laid out for you. And he has said to us this morning, come and dine, come and dine, come and dine. It is all yours freely. You can come and eat at my table anytime. Oh, my friend, but that's not all. That's not all. You see, over 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, I am going away to prepare a home for you. But he made another promise. He said, I'm coming again to take home those who love me. And my friend, he's gone away. But for those who love him, he's coming again. I said he's coming again. And we will, he will welcome us into his forever home. And there is going to be, my friend, there is going to be a banquet feast that is going to be laid out before us. It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And it is going to be greater than our minds can even think or we can ever imagine. It is going to be something greater than we could ever have ever experienced in our lives. We are going to be served the best of best foods that we have ever eaten. Oh, think about it this morning. Think about it this morning. The great apostle Paul is going to be at that banquet feast. And we're going to be able to talk with the apostle Paul. He's going to be able to tell us about the great miracles that he saw and the missionary journeys that he went on. 
We're going to be able to sit down with Peter, James, and John, and they're going to tell us the stories. They're going to tell us the stories of how they saw Jesus perform miracles, heal the sick, and raise the dead. Oh, my friend, it is going to be wonderful to be able to sit down with these great apostles. But my friend, that is not the greatest thing about this marriage supper. The greatest thing about this marriage supper is that the King of kings and the Lord of lords is going to be present at this banquet feast. And we are going to eat with the, at the marriage supper of Lamb with Jesus Christ himself. Oh, my friend, what a day. What a day of rejoicing that is going to be. And my friend, he He's coming again. I said he's coming back again. He's coming back again. And I cannot hardly wait. I said I cannot hardly wait because the king is coming. I said the king is coming. And if you're not ready, you better get your rapture clothes on because he's coming, my friend. He is coming again, and he's coming soon. Come on, stand to your feet this morning. Lift your voice to God. Lift your hands to God and say, God, I thank you today for your amazing grace. Oh, God, that you have welcomed me into the family of God. Hallelujah, God, that you have given me what I did not deserve. Your amazing grace. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. And you gave it all for us at the cross. And Lord, we thank you today. Oh, God, because we know that it is nothing that we have done ourselves. But, oh, God, it is all because of what you have done for us through your Son. And Lord, what a great day of rejoicing that is going to be when we all gather around the throne room of God and worship you forever and ever and ever and ever. Lord, we deserve, oh God, punishment. But in your grace, you forgave us and adopted us into your own, very own family. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Jesus. Because the price you paid for us, and the fact that you laid down your life so we could have eternal life. And we give praise to your name this morning. Amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed. This is the most important part of the service, my friend. It's the time that you get to decide what you're going to do with the word that you've heard. And let me ask you, do you long for Jesus? Do you long for Jesus? He longs for you to be gracious to you. And He's offering you all the things that you hunger for. The table this morning is loaded and overflowing. And He's waiting for you to come to Him. Come and taste and see that the Lord is good. His arms are open wide. And He's smiling and saying, taste and come and experience the amazing grace that I have to offer you. And right where you are, you say, Pastor Brent, I need to surrender my life to Christ. I need to experience, I want to experience His amazing grace. Come on, you haven't surrendered your life to Christ. Or maybe you've drifted from your commitment to Christ and you say, Pastor Brent, I need to make a new dedication to serve Jesus. And that's you. Come on, let me see your hand. Say, Pastor, that's me. I need to give my life to Christ. I need to rededicate my life to Christ. I need Him to be my Lord and my Savior. Hallelujah. Say, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Hallelujah. Just lift up your hand. Let me see it. You can put it right back down. I want to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I will pray for you. I want you to be ready if Jesus were to come today. I want you to be ready this morning. My friend, He's coming. He's coming soon. When is he coming? I don't know. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be this week, this month, this year. I don't know. But I do know this. He's coming. Because he said he would. And my friend, he keeps his promises. Hallelujah. You say, Pastor, I need Jesus. Let me see your hand. He's offered amazing grace, my friend. Amazing grace. Hallelujah. All right. How many would say, Pastor Brent? I need victory over fear this morning. I need victory over fear today. Come on, let me see your hand. I need victory over fear, yes? Fear, fear, worry, anxiety, whatever it is. You say, Pastor, I need victory over it this morning. Come on, let me see your hand. Yes, 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 yes. I see those hands right there. I see those hands. 
Hallelujah. God doesn't want you to have the spirit of fear nor live in fear. He wants you to live in faith. Hallelujah. He wants you to be liberated. And there are times, listen, there are times when we all struggle with fear. But perfect love casts out all fear. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many say, Pastor Brent? Hallelujah. I want to be ready when Christ comes, and I want to take as many people with me when he does come. Come on, miss your hand. Yes, 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 yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for those that are watching online. God bless you today. Pray God.